you mentioned the new HIV diagnosis by year um, were seven to 10 cases per year? I'm sorry, about 70 to 80. Oh, 70 to 80. 70, seven zero to eight zero. Okay. I, I was gonna get happy there. I thought, you know, I'm like seven a year, and it's, I mean, it's bad enough, but. And then you also mentioned about the gonorrhea diagnosis. Um, you said it can cause serious illnesses, health issues. What are some of those health issues that they, this having this having contracted that disease can cause on someone? Yeah, thank you for that question. So both gonorrhea and chlamydia have been associated in people with, uh, especially in, in cisgender females, people with the vagina and uterus. These infections can ascend the reproductive tract, and they can cause things such as infertility, chronic pelvic pain, uh, an infection known as pelvic inflammatory disease, uh, among others. Uh, so these are very serious. Uh, some of them ectopic pregnancy, where there's scarring of some of the reproductive tract, and so the, the baby uh, potentially starts to develop outside of the uterus. These are things that can be life-threatening emergencies. Uh, and I see a significant number of patients that just have chronic pain uh, from these. So these are all that happen in a subset of uh, folks that, have, that get these infections, but are very serious uh, complications. Would those complications also relate to syphilis, or is they have a syphilis different is a little bit different. So syphilis is, uh, is what we would call a, a systemic disease. It's something that disseminates and goes all over. Uh, complications of syphilis can really be nasty, and they can be nasty decades down the road. So tertiary syphilis can cause early dementia. It can cause heart disease. It can cause uh, problems with your aorta, and it can be life-threatening. Uh, so syphilis is not something uh, to trifle with and uh, has been expon exponentially increasing, unfortunately, in our state. In Rhode Island it is? In Rhode Island, yep. I'll throw the graph back up here. You know, it's interesting with syphilis, the, we were both in Rhode Island and as a country, we were close to eliminating syphilis uh, a few decades ago. We were approaching zero cases. And what happened is this, this infection started to spread specifically in gay and bisexual men and be associated also with HIV transmission. And so even in our state, we do see the majority of these new infections among men still, but it's started to spill over now uh, into the general population, which is why we are seeing some cases of congenital syphilis, so babies are starting to be affected as well. And what is H -A -H -S -V? So sorry for that, uh, human uh, simplex virus, uh, so HSV, the cause of genital herpes, that's the common name, uh, is, is another very common STI. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions to Dr. Chan? Hi, Dr. Chan. It's good to see you in person, and thank you for all your work on COVID. We're so lucky to have your expertise here. Uh, I think some of the data that you showed um, is so special to Rhode Island because we did have the opportunity to look at the impacts of uh, decarceration or, you know, on, on sex work, and I think the results speak for themselves from a public health perspective. I just wanted to know um, whether you think, like how you think of Rhode Island as a special case, because I think we are gathered here because there is so much potential given legislative histories in this state. Do you see in a national conversation people pointing to similar um, public health metrics of decriminalization, and is that where like a national conversation is headed, or do you think we really have a special opportunity as Rhode Islanders, given our legislative history and the unique data that we have? Yeah, it's a great question. Listen, I always think we have a unique opportunity in Rhode Island. The thing that I, one of the things I love about Rhode Island is we're a small state. We generally get along. Uh, people are generally on the same page. And I do think that we have to work together on this stuff and put some of our differences aside because at the end of the day, we actually all have the same goal. And so I'm reminded of that. We have the same goal. Uh, and I think, you know, one thing I often tout Rhode Island to my colleagues from across the country is that we do serve as a model state we can be a model state. And I love the fact that our state's progressive. Uh, I, think, I do think we did a good job during the COVID pandemic. And I think that's reflective that us as a state, our state leaders, public health, academics, uh, clinical sector, generally tend to be on the same page. So I do think uh, this is an important issue. I do think we're ahead of the curve. And it's uh, one thing I love about our state. Thank you, Elena. Uh, Robin? <clears throat> 
Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Chan. Um, I just have a question. You talk about repressive policies that lead to an increase in, um, in transmission of HIV and STDs. And so I was wondering if you could make that more specific, what exactly are those policies that, you know, that lead to greater transmission, since that's, you know, what we're tasked to talk about here today? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, that's a broad encompassing term, which I think is what you're hitting on. Uh, I think for the purposes of this, uh, certainly when you criminalize something, people are less likely to talk about it, to be honest about it, report it for sure. Um, so in this case, we're talking about criminalization, but it also deals with stigma, comfort, uh, et cetera. So just repressive policies in general. And are those different than what you would see, for example, in legalization versus decriminalization? Is there something very specific about those different types of, of policies that would lead to greater, greater transmission? Yeah, my guess is uh, when I think about repressive policies, it's really a combination. It's really a spectrum, right, from uh, it being, you know, criminalized to uh, legalized, supported. Um, and I think regardless of what you think about the behaviors themselves, I think the goal of this is to really make sure that all people have access to care, that they have access to the correct and accurate uh, information so that they can make informed decisions about their health. And again, when you have these repressive policies, it drives the conversation underground and, you, and people are uh, not willing to report these behaviors and therefore you can't even have that informed conversation. And we also, uh, you know, it drives the data and the reporting underground so we don't have a clear picture of what's happening. And then we see these adverse outcomes as we're discussing today with HIV and STI case rates uh, and what we're trying to do is really to get the bottom of these structural issues so that we can address them and make sure that people can be as healthy as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Representative Agello. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Chairwoman Williams. Uh, Dr. Chan, thank you for your time today and your wisdom and all that you've done for us with co fighting COVID. I'm, I'm curious, on the last page, the last slide, you say evidence demonstrates that repressive policies and criminalization of sex work leads to adverse health outcomes among sex workers, including a higher risk of HIV STIs. Uh, you say evidence there. Is, is there data um, comparing a state with um, more repressive policies to other states or other countries? Is there data that we can look at? There is, and I can perhaps send that around to the commission, uh, some of those specific studies. I summarized here on this slide a, uh, uh, what's known as a review of all the work that's been done. And so they basically pool all the results of multiple studies uh, to get to some of these numbers. But you can see here on this uh, slide, perhaps, in one of my first slides, where I talked about people, uh, when, when, uh, when there are repressive policies in some of these settings, compared to settings that do not, it appears to increase the risk of HIV and other STIs by almost twofold. So there is evidence to that, and I can send around some of the specific data related to that. And what are those countries or states with the less repressive policies and therefore better numbers? Yeah, that I would have to get the details for you. Okay, thank yep. you. Please do. Will do. Are there any other, thank you, Representative Vigello. Are there any other questions, suggestions? Hello. Um, I took the HIV class at Brown um, to be a professional test counselor, and some of the things that um, we were concerned about is people weren't being asked what type of sex they were have. They weren't, um, primary doctors weren't telling people about PrEP or PEP. Um, we know from our survey of 1,500 sex workers, more than half of them didn't trust their medical providers. We know about mandatory uh, testing for people arrested for prostitution-related charges while the clients, when they're arrested, don't get the mandatory reporting. But I'm curious, as far as how many people are coming into the STD clinic, how many of them, what percent would you think acknowledge that they're involved in sex work? And then I wanted to ask you if you could talk about, you know, uh, Coyote created the continuing medical education classes for healthcare providers to start these conversations that we have a right 
to be honest with their health care providers and ask questions about our body and how that can start to break down some of the stigma. Thank you. Yeah, so good question. So uh, in some of the STI clinics that uh, I work as part in the state, about 1% to 2% of people, depending uh, on the exact population that you look at. Um, and I totally agree, I think, with your point, and as a physician myself, is that we do need, in general, as a clinical community, to do a little bit of a better job uh, being open and to having those discussions. I think just discussions about sexual health in general uh, and this is part of what I mean when I say that some of these discussions are being driven underground. I think in a perfect world, and what's recommended and what the clinical community should be doing, of course, it's just having an open discussion about sex in general. That's the first place to start, even before you start, of course, talking about sex work, et cetera. So I definitely think there's room for improvement there. I will remember back when I was in medical school, I'm sounding a little bit old, uh, and I'm trying to think about this was uh, 1996 to 2000, is I don't remember ever getting a class on, uh, on sex or how to talk about sex. And I heard Vermont ma mentioned, I actually went to the University of Vermont, uh, so I lived there for 10 years. Uh, but I never got a class on sex, for example. So uh, as I talk to medical students now, they are getting some more of that education. Uh, at the Department of Health, we certainly work with the providers and do a lot of training and didactic sessions about HIV STIs uh, and just basic how to talk about sex. And I know because I give half those. Uh, but I do agree it's an important point to highlight and that we can always do better, certainly as a clinical community. Hi, Dr. Chan. Um, I wanted to thank you also for your work on this. And um, there's this idea that as sex workers are some, there's the term sexperts <laughs> on sex, right? Because when you have a lot of sex and you negotiate consent, that can make you an expert on the, uh, the, that subject. Um, I think that I and my colleagues have had many difficult times working with the medical providers. And many times we actually end up educating them on things like STI transmission or even lab testing. And this happened a few weeks ago when I went and got my own STI screening. Um, and I asked my women's health clinic as a non-binary person, that's interesting also that, <laughs> that it's only for women. Um, so I went into my women's health clinic and I, and I got my blood drawn. And I was like, oh, can I do the swabs as well? Because I'd like to be thorough in my STI you know, testing. And they had no idea what I was talking about. And I was like, I'd like for there to be oral and anal swabs, obviously, because they can show up um, in one part of the body and not the other. And I ended up educating all the nurses in that women's clinic about the fact that they did not, not only did not offer that in this women's clinic, um, but they had no idea. So I think it's an interesting thing that like there's this like idea that sex workers are, you know, um, you know, we, we are, we have a lot to add to this conversation, especially around education and particularly around people who actually work in the health field. And I think that that's something that doesn't always get, you know, talked about. I see it's a lot better in HIV and AIDS clinics and on my HIV and AIDS clinics, they always do swabbing. And so I wanted to see if you could maybe speak a little bit about the gender disparities between sort of feminized bodies and women and, and men in, in, in testing and, um, and also in sex work, right? Because we are sitting on this, commission and there's there's not a lot of like I don't see any male sex workers that I am looking at and and forgive me <laughs> not but there's a reason for that the invisibility of that and the sort of the gendered issues around how we gather data w testing um, and and transmission high rates of African American female transmission of HIV infection right now nationally yeah, I think you raised some great points. As I mentioned, actually, most of my work historically has been done among cisgender uh, uh, male uh, sex workers. So totally appreciate the point. And I think you also highlight another one of those structural factors uh, related also to Bella's question, the previous question about just making people feel comfortable uh, and discussing their sexuality and their gender, sexual orientation, et cetera. But all these issues to me are related. And at the end of the day, you just want to create that open environment. And this also has very important uh, public health and clinical uh, consequences, as you're suggesting. If you don't take that history, you may not realize that people need to be swabbed, for example, at different sites. And so just for the, uh, to fill us all in here, right, most of the time if you ask, for example, for a gonorrhea or chlamydia test uh, from your physician, they'll ask you to pee in a cup. 
well, that checks for gonorrhea or chlamydia of your, your penis or vagina because that's where your, your, piece, your urine's coming from. But if you're having sex that involves your rectum or your throat, either performing oral sex or bottoming, having anal receptive sex, then it may not pick up the gonorrhea or chlamydia of those sites. So that's why it's important to understand and have this open discussion with, uh, with the, as a physician, with the patient in front of you, with your provider, so that you can provide the best medical care and address some of these things that we're talking about today. Can we, can we um, uh, find out, Dr. Chan, what states or, or um, clinics do the swab that Leia um, mentioned? Because that would be interesting to know which ones do it and which ones don't, if, if it's at all possible to obtain that information, you think? So it's, it's a clinical recommendation and guideline by the CDC and others uh, that people, that physicians and providers really need to be able to do that. So my uh, suggestion would be that we need to, we, Department of Health, the state, uh, clinical community, need to do a better job educating all physicians. Now there's certain, if you go to a sexual health clinic, if you, I practice myself at Open Door Health, which is an LGBTQ health center, we obviously do it, the Merriam Hospital STI Clinic, Planned Parenthood, uh, all these sexual health focused clinics definitely do it. Uh, it's really more as we talk about some of these topics, uh, again, back to some of the previous points, it's really about educating the general clinical community about how to just even talk, ask about sexual health, and certainly screen for some of these STIs. Proceed. Oh, thanks. Yes. <laughs> um, hi. Um, so in recent years with my work in Vermont, um, several colleagues and friends have come to me in their OBGYN experience is saying that certain screenings were deprioritized because the sheer volume of infections. And I was wondering if you could speak on that um, in terms of the community in Rhode Island, specifically like HPV and other more commonplace quote unquote STIs. Yeah, so unfortunately during the COVID pandemic, as we all uh, recently remember, is that there is a lack of supplies for so many things. And some of the supplies for STI testing, like some of those swabs that you were swabbing noses, et cetera, uh, were also being used to swab other things for STIs. So there was a shortage of supplies for STI testing, unfortunately, during the pandemic. And there were recommendations from the CDC, which we, of course, supported uh, in, in uh, Rhode Island, about limiting STI testing during the peak of the pandemic back in 2020, because we just, we needed to prioritize and focus everything on uh, on COVID testing, uh, unfortunately. So at the moment, we're in a much better place and those shortages don't exist, uh, but they did during the pandemic and they did hamper our response uh, to STIs. And just thinking about, as I, we briefly touched on the impact of COVID uh, during the pandemic, one of them, the word on the street was that a lot of people had less, less sex partners uh, because of uh, the, the restrictions. Also, a lot of clinics closed and didn't see people in person as well. So we did a fair amount of treatment over the phone. Uh, just as a side note, telemedicine was so important during the pandemic and continues to be important for some of the folks too that we care for in terms of facilitating access. So some lessons learned from the pandemic. I think it was tough and this is one of those areas that we also saw uh, some uh, impact on in terms of STI sexual health. Uh, I noticed, uh, I've heard a lot of feedback from people in general, not just sex workers, that primary doctors, when they're asked, even in my case, when I first asked my primary to be tested, looked at my results, oh, they only tested me for syphilis. What about gonorrhea? What about chlamydia? What about this? What about throat and vaginal swabs? So I know in uh, the porn industry, they, it's either called a six or an eight point test where you're tested for everything. And I also wonder, even if you're asked the right questions, how many people are being honest about whether they're using condoms with every act, what, how many partners they have, what type of sex they have. And I wonder if maybe we should start teaching physicians like, you know, when I go for my annual physical, they always ask, do you want an HIV test? I said, of course. Um, maybe they should ask, hey, it's just good practice that everyone's tested for everything once a year. I also want to point out as um, there's this narrative that um, monogamous people are safe from STDs, and in my experience, when people cheat, they lie. Um, and I think every responsible adult, whether you're married or anything, should be tested at least once a month. And I'd like to point out that when we surveyed 1,500 sex workers, they had better condom use than the general public per the CDC's data. Um, thank you.
It's a great point. I think one thing that we always struggle with in public health and including with COVID is the balance between uh, resources and feasibility. So totally agree. All your points are, are very reasonable. Uh, it's just a matter of do we have the resources, uh, et cetera. You know, I, I think uh, one approach that I often use is I tell people who should be the type of person that should be screened for an STI. So instead of asking people all the time, if I'm worried they may not be reporting everything, I will say, well, for people that are having uh, anal sex, for people that are performing oral sex, then we should really be doing a throat swap. Do you want a throat swap today? And that way you're not asking them for their exact behaviors. So there's some of the, so there's some of the ways that you frame it. But I think at the end of the day, we really need, you know, in the ideal situation, and I think what we strive for, what I strive for, is to really create that safe space for people to be uh, willing to chat about their sexual health and not feel judged uh, in a confidential and safe manner. What advice do you have for talking to opponents, so your own opponents in the public health field who can't possibly look beyond this abundance of data that says like destigmatizing, decarceral approaches are the way to go? But because I think overwhelmingly, like historically, people have continuously turned to threats of public health um, and, you know, deviant populations as vectors and threats of disease. And so that's why containment and policing are such popular interventions. But do you have any advice for us on how to communicate these better to people who you often find yourself in opposition with professionally in, in, in your work? Yeah, I think I would remind people of something I've often said during the COVID pandemic is that we really need to focus on the data and the science. And so the reason why we're talking about STIs is because they do affect the broader public. It's not just about you having an STI, although as a physician, yes, it is about you, but it's also about the broader public. So when we talk about from the public health perspective addressing these, you know, we need to get a handle on this and it involves treating everyone. And the data really shows that when you have some of these repressive policies that people are more likely uh, to, to, to get HIV and STI. So the answer based on the data and the evidence and the science is that we need to do, we need to try other things. And we should always continue to evolve and learn and study what works, what doesn't work and continue to improve. That's part of life and certainly part of public health. I guess if you were um, to enter another legislative space or um, any, anywhere uh, where folks would be taking suggestions or maybe even accepting training on how to communicate, um, you know, with um, the public when, the, when, when issues of sex work and STI exposure comes up in an appointment day to day, can you name any like resources um, that would be kind of like clickbait away, any, any recent bits of literature, any data that would be user friendly to folks who aren't in this line of work? There's data that exists through the CDC. I think the first thing I would recommend is just thinking about how we uh, address sexual health in general. And part of it is, you know, from a clinical perspective, it's just talking about it and creating that, again, that safe space uh, where we can, uh, where people are engaged and, and, and we care. So uh, I would refer people to the CDC. I think you did identify one of those areas where there's just limited data, so limited, uh, limited resources about sex work specifically and STIs. Um, I wondered, I'm a public health person, Sue, so I love all the garbly goop, great um, words, but I wondered if there was a way in which that you and I could kind of like talk through a little bit what it, the real world reality of what happens when someone is uh, marginalized and policed around their sexuality and how that looks for the lay person. Like, let's say you're my doctor and I come to you and I'm like afraid of telling you all my sexual behaviors because I'm afraid that you're going to one judge me. I'm afraid um, if I have an anxiety disorder, it's going to trigger anxiety for me, right? Um, what are the other issues that you see or feel as a physician with a patient that would prevent them from first disclosing? And then maybe we could talk about like the real world impacts of what that happens on the outside, but just the fear of not even being able to disclose to someone who is legally bound not to share my, my, my information. I mean, this is the reality, because this is what has happened to myself and many of other sex worker friends. I know in my head that you can't share my personal information legally. 
But the reality, the real world reality of it is I'm going, are they going to take my kids? Is this somehow going to find its way into a lawsuit someday? Is there some HIPAA situation where my information of my sex work could be disclosed? Like, these are all things that I think about because you your sex work can be used to take your children away in, in, in legal court cases and these kinds of things. So there are all these like little ways in which that sex workers have to think about the long-term reality of how our stigma and criminality can actually affect us down the road. If we have a partner, if we have a child, if we want to adopt, if I want to be a foster parent, all these things that may be closed off to me one day because of my sex work history. So I just wondered if you could maybe talk maybe some real world realities of that. Yeah, and it's uh, I think as you're alluding to, it's a t it's a two way street and a two way uh, relationship when you have a patient and as a physician. As a physician, if someone is not reporting to me what they're doing, then I'm not going to make accurate decisions about what's best for their health. And so if someone's not reporting to me sexual activity, substance use, mental health, and all this has happened before, I found out you know I've had some patients. Uh, who I've taken care of for years that are, you know, have addiction problems and I had no idea and that they seemed, you know, I couldn't tell. Uh, and it's the same way for sex uh, and different sexual behaviors and certainly for sex work uh, is that if people don't report those behaviors to me, then I can't, I won't make the right decision about what's best for them. I won't even know. But how do we close the gap between organizations and, and health officials that do have um, kind of puritanical agendas? Because I feel like it's no secret that not, you know, not only in Vermont, but certainly nationally, internationally, there are clinics that might pose reproductive health organizations who are maybe religiously fueled or otherwise um, and pushing a certain pro-life agenda. And while HIPAA might on paperwork protect somebody, um, someone could go outside of office, you know, uh, hours as a concerned citizen and report, you know, the Child Protective Services, et cetera. So like how, you know, what would be your recommendation moving forward to protect marginalized communities in those instances where they might find themselves um, in a place where the only care available is that with an agenda? Yeah, it's a great question. I think to me, uh, what you're touching on is really the need uh, for good data and science and accurate resources. And just on a broader note, I think that's one thing that's made me uh, really sad just about events over the last four or five years. It's just the focus on misinformation. And we've seen the power of misinformation and disinformation. We've seen it during COVID. We've seen it in other aspects. And I think this is a, an example where we just, again, need to focus on the data, the science, what works, and to continuously improve and get better. I suppose I just, I, I kind of want to pick your brain for, for solutions. How, um, like if you were to conceive of a protective measure in legislature, you know, um, not so long ago, uh, we were having conversations like this in New Hampshire, a protective bill of rights for sex workers to be able to seek medical care without discrimination. I'm wondering if you have recommendations like that in your work, you know, what, if, what are your thoughts? What decisions can, can we make in government entities to ensure that religiously oriented places of public health aren't tearing people's lives apart when they need to get tested and receive care. I don't know if I know enough about that to make an educated decision. I would say as we talk about some of these, what I firmly believe, for example, uh, about uh, incentivizing and making these structural changes, uh, for example, to do things like tests for HIV and STIs. And so one thing I've often thought, and one thing that we do in some areas, is incentivize clinics and have quality measures which hold clinics, uh, clinicians, providers accountable uh, for some of, these, um, some of these things that we're trying to address. So I understand with uh, mandatory uh, testing when you're arrested for prosecution-related charges, um, We've actually found um, test results in charging documents, which we were horrified. I remember in the case of Celeste Gabe out in California, that was a, a trafficking victim of several police officers. Her HIV status was projected out to the media in violation. So I also 
This comes into how many policies the government have created this system, like the anti-prostitution pledge that was struck down as unconstitutional after 10 years, where we didn't give other countries money for HIV and malaria if they wouldn't sign this pledge. Brazil returned $40 million to the United States because signing it means you can't do outreach to sex workers. You, or, and they weren't going to risk their public health and safety under this law that didn't make sense. Thank you.